Thank you so much for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me get my screen shared. We'll get moving. All right. Does that look like something to everyone? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna talk. Uh, take the next 45 minutes or so. Talk about uh, the art of light and pixels. Uh, if anyone's got questions, we'll have a block of time at the end. And if anyone, if there's anything along the way, uh, feel free to stop me as well. Um, but thanks so much for uh, for having me to the chat uh, today. I'm gonna so just brief overview sort of objectives on my end or hopefully show you some, some technologies that you haven't seen before, uh, demonstrate different uh, display technologies as sort of a design element uh, that could be used in, in many different kinds of projects. I work particularly or primarily in experience design for sort of commercial clients and things like that, but I also have a strong artistic background. So I think there's a lot of applicable places to use uh, different display technologies. Um, going to show you a little bit about displays as sort of a component of storytelling and, and using those in different ways. And hopefully just to help inspire you when you're doing your own work to just create something sort of strange and beautiful uh, with these different technologies. So uh, as far as the sort of structure of the talk, I'm going to just really briefly explain my background and, and why I'm so interested in these different display technologies and sort of context for why I might have done so much research into them. Um, and then from there, I'll give sort of a brief history of uh, just different light manipulation techniques. I feel like it's it's really interesting to get sort of a, a historical context for some of this stuff uh, before we dive into like things that are always touted as never been done before, but then you find out that they were done 200 years ago. Uh, and I think it's interesting to see people doing the same things over and over. Uh, and then we'll get into actual sort of strange display technologies uh, and just kind of go through those. And then after that, do a little bit of a wrap up uh, where I, I can explain some of my like reflections on using some of these, experiencing them, working with them on, on projects and things like that. But uh, to dive in briefly on my background. Uh, so I have a, a pretty strong artistic background. I went to an engineering school for its art program, I went to RPI uh, in Troy, New York, and uh, my work in grad school was exploring the relationship between sound and images. I've always had a strong music background, but got it a little bit into programming and exploring what it would mean to, to kind of uh, to use uh, visuals as sort of like an instrument alongside performers, uh, and that took a lot of different programming. Uh, tactics to, to make that happen. So I've done live visuals for, for bands, I've done music videos, done sort of light art explorations and hardware. So all kinds of different ways of manipulating light and images in digital space and physical space. Um, so there's always a lot of like perceptual tricks that I like to just uh, be aware of. And then moving out of sort of academic background, uh, some of my professional background, uh, for 10 years, I uh, led the creative tech team at an experience design company called Fake Love, based in New York, where we did a lot of uh, experiential installations with projection and uh, generative visuals and uh, performance elements and things like that. Uh, that company closed in 2022, but got a lot of strange requests for uh, for technologies over over the years there. Um, so it really drove me to look into all of the, the different stuff that I'll be showing you later. But now I work at Deep Local, which is a, a great company founded in 2006 in Pittsburgh uh, via the CMU Art Tech Lab. And uh, it's also a creative technology and experience design company it's acquired by WPP in 2017. And uh, similarly to a lot of these companies, it's kind of hard to describe exactly what it is that we do besides just really cool projects. Uh, so we do interactive installations. There's some pictures here. Uh, this one on the left is uh, sort of a, an arcade cabinet that we fabricated to help teach kids uh, sort of the basic, basic concepts of programming. Uh, 
done a lot of permanent installations for Google. We've got a couple of pictures here. One is this, this button wall uh, that are like these buttons that you can press to like kind of change the, the display on the wall. We've got these mechanical flowers on the right top there uh, that are these interactive flowers that open and close when you get near them. Uh, done sort of producty uh, stunts for, for different clients like this Reese's Puffs sort of musical instrument box. Uh, also do things for events and, and uh, this one on the bottom left is for uh, like a Stranger Things sort of uh, viral launch event that we did last year. So lots of really fun stuff. And as you can imagine, uh, the the types of requests that we might get for, for stuff like this are all over the place. Um, I'm gonna play a short video next. Uh, let me make sure that the audio is all set up for that. Second. There it is. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to play just a video just to introduce Deep Local a little bit more. Uh, once again, to give you some more context on, on where some of this stuff coming up is going to come from. Right. All right, and this is Pittsburgh. Deep Local was kind of an, an accident. We've created, I'm trying to think of the right words. What I want to say is <laughs> the people at Deep Local um, they are... Everyone at Deep Local that I've met is just a good human. We actively built a company that was good at not doing the same thing twice, so... They're the arms and fingers and tentacles of one creative, one creative mind. We create opportunities for our staff to put things into the world that they are proud of. Let's go! to be able to work across advertising campaigns, physical spaces, urban infrastructure, beautiful aesthetic installations. The ability to make things happen that most people and most companies can't make happen. And the diverse talent is extraordinary. Do you believe in magic? I think we're all taught that we are supposed to find our path. There's a few of us out there who say, well, that doesn't quite work, because I kind of want to be a carpenter and I want to be an astronaut. Why can't we be both? People from different backgrounds and who work in hybrid ways, it forms a kind of an oasis for people who maybe don't feel a connection to a single discipline, but feel a connection to the notion of working across many disciplines. They talk to and work with the engineers to understand the why behind the product, how it works, to then be able to take that and translate that into an experience yeah, I don't think I've ever gotten a no, that's not possible from Deep Local. You know that when you bring Deep Local into a project, they are going to add something to it that you could not have imagined, and it's going to be better for it. But turning things into a reality is, man, that's, it's a motherfucker. And now for something completely different. Right. Everyone can still hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. So yeah, as you can see, it's, it's a really wide range of, of uh, projects. And you can imagine over the years, you just get so many requests for like, can we do this? Can we do that? And then when you do that, you know, a few dozen, hundred times, you start to build up sort of a collection of, of these things. And, and that's what's driven me to do a lot of the research on Displays in particular, but I, I've done similar things for a lot of other technologies. And I think just having that, that broad range of, of stuff is super important. So quickly, I'll get into just like a, a brief history of light manipulation stuff. Uh, obviously, sort of a desire to uh, kind of control and manipulate light and direct it goes way back uh, in terms of just interacting with fire and then uh, Oops. Uh, there's some early precursors of things like shadow plays, and you could say even stained glass windows. Uh, I'll briefly cover a couple of these things coming up. So pyrotechnics, color organs, uh, Pepper's Ghost, they're going to come later, but there's also other technologies like uh, for, for theater, like Phantasmagoria and, and Magic Lantern, and some, some other stuff in the 20th century. So 
these are all just different optical tricks that sort of grow over time and uh, again, give some more context to some of the digital stuff that I'll be showing later. Um, so this is probably the only appropriate use of that like keynote transition with, with the fireworks, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> the I think early pyrotechnics are, I don't know that you could like, I, I haven't done the research to the depth to be able to like prove that this was like a, a real precursor, but I think there are a lot of common threads that you can draw from like early pyrotechnics into generative media and sort of large scale spectacle for concerts and even stuff that you see at like Times Square and things like that. So uh, in doing some research in this, this early stage, there are a lot of uh, books on early pyrotechnics and they're like these fascinating stories about like structures that were built explicitly for basically filling with fireworks and like having them uh, kind of destroy themselves or just be sort of a, a point of, of focus for an event. Uh, so you can see on the left there, one of those buildings just covered with fireworks that then like opens up and reveals itself. Um, there's another one of this, I think this structure on the top right is, uh, it's like on water, thankfully, but just has lots of fireworks installed all around it. I think for the original story, there's an orchestra for it. So there's music along with these fireworks shows, but also involving structures. And then on the bottom right is just modern day projection mapping, where we just take a bunch of projectors, point them at a building and sort of have a, a similar visual spectacle going on. So a, an interesting comparison of like, things from the 1700s to now, uh, even stuff that was done at the end of the Victorian era, they had like these large structures. You can see on this picture, it's 200 feet by 60 feet structure that they just covered with little pixels of fire to like make an image of Queen Victoria and, and, uh, and other people, or just other images of, of things from far away. Um, and that one, these are both from like 1892 or something like that. Uh, one of my favorite examples is these, uh, this video that has a, uh, a house made of fire that has uh, some firemen coming in a burning fire truck. And they're, they're men covered in suits that have these like little, little flame pixels on them. They're wearing asbestos suits uh, mm -hmm. to make this happen. And so it's firemen made a fire going to put out a house made a fire. I, I think it's just a really great joke, even if it's uh, kind of terrifying to watch. This is what people found entertaining. And I think this was like 1910 or 20 or something. This is like a colorized uh, video, but people used to do some, <laughs> some really weird stuff before we could do more electric light manipulation. Um, so I think it's it's just, again, fascinating context. Um, also working with like color manipulation and, and music performance stuff. There are these color organs that, uh, that were made in the mid 1700s for just like candles and lifting little slats that would go along with the music that you would play. Um, and jumping ahead a couple hundred years, just I, I think there's also a lot of interesting parallels with, uh, it's more of a musical term, but there's this uh, concept of extended technique, which is like taking a technology and then misusing it for, or, or even like bending its capabilities to do something else. A common example is like, uh, taking a piano and like sticking like a screwdriver or some paper clips or uh, a clothespin on the strings and kind of manipulating the sound to make it sound like a totally different instrument. And you can take that idea and kind of put it onto more visual explorations with, with new technologies. This particular video here is for this uh, technology called the Wobulator or this, I don't know if you would call it an art project or a prototype, but the, the Wobulator it's made in the, uh, I'm forgetting the exact date, but in the, let's say mid seventies uh, by manipulating a TV set with some extra magnetic coils and kind of manipulating the actual uh, 
path of the electrons to, to hit the screen. So kind of misusing technology for a specific purpose. Um, so that was a, a whirlwind of historical displays. So now I'll move on to modern displays. Um, and before I get into those, I think, you know, I'm, I'm talking about alternative displays, but I think there's, uh, it's probably worth talking about like, well, what, what do I mean are like sort of normal displays? Uh, so I, you can imagine some different display types as being like just regular LCD monitors that we're all looking at right now. There's LCD video walls you might see like at an airport. Uh, there's LED video walls that are getting more and more common all over the place. There's OLED for sort of high-end TVs, the projection. There's head-mounted displays for uh, for VR headsets and things like that. So there's a lot of sort of common uses, but I think that these are really just a, a small subset of the capabilities that we have for, for manipulating light and, and creating different scales of spectacles, different uh, different ways of, of displaying content in, in purposeful ways. Um, and for me, I, I find it helpful to break some of this stuff down into like the simple components of like displays are just ways of modulating light in different ways. It's, it's originating from some source, it's either getting reflected off of something else or it's passing through and getting refracted or getting filtered in some way. And then that's going to make it into someone's someone's eye and get processed by the brain. And I think uh, when you can like look at each piece of that uh, sort of equation while you're coming up with uh, how to use these technologies, it, it helps uh, find new ways to like, oh, maybe I can put an extra filter in there, or an extra way of like bouncing that light around to, to be able to work with them in different ways. So it's trying to look at them more simply than these just like sort of black box uh, pieces of technology. Um, so what I mean when I say alternative displays, and this is really more of like my personal categorization and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit as well, but um, there's a lot of, different displays out there when you keep digging and, and you try to figure out like, all right, what are different ways that if, if I had a crayon box with all of these different things, what would the categories be for all of them? Um, and a lot of my work in this space has been like, how do I, how do I categorize these in different ways? And I'm sure there, there's always gray spaces between different ones, but, um, uh, over the next like 20 minutes or so, I'll try and cover the ones that are that are here. We'll see how much time we've got left. Um, but uh, before I get there, I think you know again, why am I doing this uh, this particular work? And I, I find for me that that creative frameworks are super important to being able to do creative technology work. Um, I think that they, help give everyone sort of a common language of how to, to look at displays. Like if you were to start a project and you're like, I, would, I just want a, an interesting way to like display this with light, you might not have a vocabulary or a common language for like how to describe what you're looking for. I often map this to like uh, either like colors of paint on a palette or even like music theory. If if different cultures didn't have their own versions of music theory, it might be harder to understand like tuning systems or, or harmonies or different structures that like just allow us to, that give us a framework to communicate in creative ways. And I think uh, that's super important. I think having these frameworks then also allows you to kind of combine and remix different, uh, different components of, of this stuff, of different technologies. I think it also gives you some guideposts for like defining new discoveries or new um, new things that might come out and kind of define them in older contexts. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that come out and you're like, oh, this is brand new. It's like, no, it's just a tweak on something that was made like five years ago. It's not, it's not always like 
some some brand new discovery. Um, and I think for me, uh, being in creative technology for for thirteen years, I've, I I personally get a lot of value out of both doing the research of this stuff, but then sharing it in a way uh, for like curious beginners to also find their way in because it's a it's a weird uh, area to work in and it's not it's still not super well defined to like find your way into this career path so i think doing what i can to like document this stuff and share it back out at the end of this all the stuff that i'll show you there's actually like a an, on, an online resource that i created that has like i think like uh it's like 40 different display technologies sort of in these categories with different example videos and and some of my insights and write-ups around each one of them but trying to create that like resource that you can go and just kind of browse the browse the stacks of like what's possible with different light manipulation techniques and I'm, and I'm updating it all the time and uh but I, I like to have this this talk version of it to give a little bit more context into uh and and to be able to just walk you through specific stuff so um oh yeah and also just promoting a, a culture of sharing, I think is also another important part of this. There's a lot of companies that uh, do this kind of work. And I think it's super important to be able to share these uh, these kinds of things because it's not so much the technologies, but it's how you use them. Uh, that's the important part, but just holding on to like proprietary knowledge around, you know, different technologies and the important part is just being able to use them in interesting ways. Um, so in terms of frameworks, I've, I've also, I mentioned that I've done this for other technologies, but, uh, alternative displays are such a small subset of creative technology too. It's like, this is a little chart that I've made. That's like, here's this within a larger system. But when you zoom out, like this is sort of all of the technologies that like a creative technologist might need to be aware of. And I know that you wouldn't be able to read that. Uh, on a remote screen, but it's uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff, uh, and it I again find it helpful to just know what all the toys in the toy box are when coming up with with uh, uh, different approaches to solving problems that might come up on uh, concepting or or other things. Um, so to start. Maybe an obvious question, what about holograms? Holograms do come up a lot in this space. Clients ask for them all the time. Uh, there's sort of a pop culture concept of a hologram that's sort of like the Star Wars Princess Leia version. Uh, there's a more like dictionary definition of a hologram that I tend to side with. It's, it's more of like a, a photography process than an actual like floating 3D digital image uh, that you can view from all sides. So I won't necessarily be mentioning holograms specifically, but that's that's sort of the line between a real hologram and, and just how uh, media might talk about stuff like this. Um, so I've got a few categories. I'll talk quickly about just practical uh, effects that you can either do at home or just uh, products that might be available now. After this, I'll get into things that are sort of emerging technologies and then uh, end with sort of uh, things that are more fringe and experimental things that like may either remain as art projects or may become other things. But uh, first we've got Pepper's Ghost. This is from the uh, 19th century. Uh, it's a super scalable thing. It's got sort of a limited usability range where like you need very balanced lighting for it to work. It needs to kind of have a uh, dark behind the person looking at it and sort of uh, get just the right balance to get that reflection. You can kind of see it in this. This is just like an example video from someone on YouTube of taking like these reflective surfaces and a screen and it's not a true 3D effect, but you do get a sense of parallax that makes it feel like this floating 3D effect, um, but it, it does kind of work best with that particular type of content. Um, 
moving on, there's also lots of different transparent uh, screen technologies. There's transparent LCD, which is basically just taking the same thing that would be in a TV or computer monitor and removing the backlight and just filling like a, a space behind it with a lot of light. Uh, that's that top left video. There's transparent LED. There's a few different types of products that are transparent LED. There's ones that are like on these metal slats that you can use in like large architectural installations, but there are other versions that are like uh, sort of adhesive LED that can be stuck on, on windows. Um, there's transparent OLED, which is uh, an emissive technology that's uh, sort of the inverse of transparent LCD in a way where like white pixels are opaque and black pixels are transparent, whereas for the transparent LCD, it's the opposite. Um, and each of these has their, their specific use cases. I think these are uh, like transparent OLED is, is good in some retail environments. Transparent LED is probably more for large scale stuff. LCD is, uh, uh, I feel like the common use is in these sort of like product display cases, uh, just to like have something behind it, kind of help sell the illusion more than it just being against a, a window or something like that. And all of these are like somewhat easy to find, different price ranges and things like that. Um, and then they have their limits on sizes. Uh, one of my favorite magic trick effects is using an LCD with a, a remote polarizer. There's different descriptors for this one, but um, the way this one works is you have a normal screen and you take uh, uh, one of the, the layers off of that screen, one of the polarizing layers. And what that does is make the screen appear white to just the naked eye. But if you take a polarizing filter and hold it in front, then you can see the image uh, anywhere. And if you twist it, it'll change the color, but it works almost exactly like you're seeing here. It's a, a really interesting sort of reveal effect. I find it really interesting to pitch for different commercial projects because it has this sort of surprise moment where you might walk past a screen that just looks white or maybe just something that looks like a light box. But if you pass uh, by some film, by some of this polarization film, then you suddenly get the image. So it's a, this one has one of the better like sort of narrative effects of like a hidden message or something like that. Um, but uh, it's a bit of a specialized project, but, but you can also do sort of a DIY version. Um, moving on, laser projection is another like, it's a common one, but it's not used as much as a lot of these other things. Uh, I think it's got a, a very interesting but particular aesthetic. Uh, so it's got, you would only use it if you had a particular style in mind. Um, I think there's also some interesting possibilities to combine it with, with regular projection. Um, I really like this piece from the collective Weird Tundra that's like this uh, installation using a bunch of laser projectors and like, uh, this sort of field hanging upside down that has these like undulating waves that go through the different uh, the different fibers to create this like volumetric effect. I've, I've seen this one in person and it looks really great. Um, you can also do cool tricks with, with lasers. There's this uh, laser banding technique that like, it actually, I think this only works to the camera, but in this video uh, on the top, um, there's like this tight synchronization that happens between the camera's shutter and like the rate of the, the laser. And it makes it look like this like floating uh, light cone that, that can change shape. But I think to the naked eye, it wouldn't necessarily look like that. But to the, to the camera, it's like this magic effect that, that you can get real time. Um, Another still sort of available now, actually some of these I need to update the examples, but uh, Looking Glass Factory has these products called, uh, there's the, the Portrait, they have some other versions, um, but these are some interesting, 
there's different ways that these have been described. There's light field displays, there's like lenticular displays, uh, and they they do really look like this in person. Like when you move your head, you get to see all the different angles. Uh, they do have some limitations for this viewing angle and uh, like how far away you can get from from it before the the volume kind of falls apart. And I think for these, there's also like a specialized content pipeline for you, you aren't necessarily just like taking a picture and dropping it in there, but you have to like do a little bit of extra work to get like 3D content working. Um, but yeah, it's like there's a, a 65 inch version of these and it's just a really large, large volume. Uh, and uh, it also works best with sort of narrow, uh, a narrow depth of field, but it's um, a really compelling thing to, to see in person. Um, this one's on the edge of like available now and like a little bit specialized. There's obviously e-ink displays that are really good for just like different lighting situations using them outdoors uh, can be used for, uh, there, there are color versions that could be used for stuff like architectural installations. They do have some limitations in terms of like the refresh rate and the ability to display colors and uh, resolution, but there's a lot of interesting possibilities there. They're also like one of the lower energy usage um, technologies on this list, just because there's not a lot of, of light getting sent out. They're just, uh, just updating when they need to. Um, Moving on to emerging sort of DIY stuff. Uh, I think that uh, this is a, this category is a little interesting because the other ones are like, you could basically Google them and find different uh, places that sell like transparent LCD or what have you. But I think in this this particular category, it's more like, what if you take one of those existing technologies and then like put a physical element or another uh, sort of custom fabricated thing on top of it to create different effects? So I've got a few different examples here. There's like this uh, interesting touchable shape from Lucy Hardcastle that's like a, I believe it's projection with some sort of specialized sensor for, for touch. Um, there's this uh, great piece from Mary Frank that's this like just an LCD screen with a custom fabricated wood front and these like lenses of, of uh, fabricated plastic on top of it. And there's like generative visuals behind it. And it creates this like really nice volumetric effect that you, know, you can imagine as you move around that you get different shapes and, and things. Um, and this piece from Yosel Song that's like this grid of fiber optic cables that kind of bend and there's projection on the bottom, but the light travels through the fiber optic cables and displays on the other end. Um, it's not necessarily the best technique for like showing detailed images, but if you're trying to do something more spatial or expressive, um, I think these are really interesting uh, artistic explorations. Um, oh, and this is uh, one of my favorite. Uh, this is a product that you can buy from this company, Rayform. Um, they have this technology that's like, I believe it's computational caustics, where it's uh, taking um, taking an image and then they run it through a special software that basically takes like, there's a point of light there's a, a lens and they're able to like bend the light onto a specific surface and like create a coherent image in a lens that otherwise looks like just a, a plain piece of plastic. And then when the light hits it just right, uh, it'll shine through into a, a coherent shape. They even have like um, jewelry you could buy where you have like a, a ring that like if you shine the sun onto like the table in front of you, you'll be able to see like a, a word that gets etched on the ring in the special special way. It's, it's a pretty magical, uh, magical thing. Um, 
There are these volumetric uh, mechanical displays. There's a lot of different approaches to these, but they often rely on something just spinning very fast with a lot of lights on it. Um, there are these like holographic fans uh, that you can set up in large grids and they create these uh, sort of floating image displays. There's this piece from Benjamin Luzon called Full Turn that's uh, basically just taking a regular LCD display, putting it on a specialized rig to spin it really, really fast, and then displaying some graphics on it so that persistence of vision kind of creates these ghostly shapes and, uh, and just beautiful forms out of light that you wouldn't be able to create otherwise. Um, same thing with this this product volume, and but there's there's a lot of stuff out here in, in these kinds of spaces, but they often to be tend to be a little bit lower resolution when it's just one, but you can still get some pretty good images out of them. Um, flexible displays are another super fun uh, thing out there. They're becoming more and more common. Um, they're ones that are large that can just be bent a little bit. They're more and more phones and devices that are coming out that are flexible uh, for smaller scale devices or smaller scale flexible displays. I think they open up some interesting user interface possibilities because we're not just interfacing with a flat screen anymore. Um, they are still more expensive than regular screens, but way more accessible than they were even five years ago. And uh, kinetic displays, this is also in that like probably more DIY space because uh, there are several examples of, of stuff like this out there, but uh, they tend to be more expensive or more specialized um, and need the creation of some unique content pipelines. Um, how am I doing on time? We have like 23 minutes left. Okay, great. So I, I'm going to go through these last ones real quick. I'm I might skip a couple actually, so I can get to my last points. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, last section is just sort of more this fully experimental stuff. Uh, I'll just show these quickly. There's kimchi and chips, light barrier, using a couple projectors, some, some lenses, and basically like tracking the path of an individual pixel bouncing off of lots of different lenses. When those uh, light paths cross, they, they, they create a, an area that's a little bit brighter than the areas around it. So you can, like, if you were to combine a bunch of pixels landing in the same area with some fog, then you get these beautiful floating spheres and other images. There's other ways to, to do a similar effect, but they, it takes a lot of uh, just a lot of math to, to make it work. Um, they've done, uh, Kimchi and Chips has done similar things with, uh, uh, in more recent years with, there's this project, Another Moon, where they took a lot of specialized lights and basically created a floating moon uh, above a cityscape and did something uh, in 2018 for this project, Halo, that actually used a lot of mirrors uh, that reflected the sun uh, in a specific way to to make a floating shape with with no action with no other light source than the sun to to create that floating visage and some some specialized fog machines. Um, other science fiction things. There's this plasma combustion concept. It it came up a lot like many many years ago. I'm not actually sure what the most recent versions of this are, but it's also like supposed to be kind of dangerous the way that it works. So I think it's difficult to say whether it could really be scaled up. Um, other researchers working with uh, acoustic levitation, where you can use ultrasonic emitters to levitate little pieces of styrofoam and other small particles to create coherent shapes and, and like animations. But as you can imagine, these are a little tricky to uh, scale up into something that could be like a useful product for other people and, and what the use cases might be. Um, so that was a lot. That was a lot of like sort of sugary fun stuff that I'm, I'm sure seemed super exciting and, uh, and, and it is, it's, it's really awesome stuff. I think 
Um, there are a lot of like practicalities that come into using this stuff that, you know, again, it's great to have all of those options out there and, and to think about all the exciting possibilities. And then there's that question of like, it's really cool. Why don't I see it everywhere? And it's a good question. Uh, something that, that I have to think about a lot uh, when working with this stuff all the time. And I think that probably the biggest one is honestly just cost and time. Some stuff uh, is gonna cost a lot more just because the demand is lower for it. Uh, some projects that I might work on might only have like a month to three months uh, for like an event-based piece or a year or longer for more permanent things. But um, sometimes you just can't get the stuff fast enough or it's just not available. Um, some things can just be seen as gimmicky if you're just trying to use something for a specific purpose. It doesn't always come across uh, in a way that's gonna make sense for everyone. Um, and I think another big hurdle is this sort of seeing as believing effect. Like some of these things look interesting in video, but if a client wants to spend uh, a lot of money to, to make something happen uh, that they've never seen before, they might be tempted to take the safer choice uh, and work with something that's more of a tried and true technology versus something that's maybe never been done before. And I think that's related to this last point of kind of self-editing where uh, me working with this stuff, I might be hesitant to even like propose it to a particular project because I'll either know that the project might not be able to afford it, might not have the timeline, the client might not be interested. So there's a little bit of like self-editing to even get some of these things out there in the world. And uh, I think other stuff, there's this expectation of progress and like novelty where we see like, uh, what I mean by that is there's like, we see, resolution go up on TVs every few years and it keeps going up and up. And I think there's a similar expectation of like, oh, well, I saw this kind of like hologram on stage at Coachella, you know, 10 years ago, isn't there something like much better now? It's not necessarily, it doesn't mean that everything has progressed as fast as, as all the other technologies, especially if people aren't investing in it. Um, another big challenge is uh, not all of these have the same like content pipeline. And that means that like, it's, it's very easy to take your laptop and plug it into a TV and just have it show the image that you have right there. But you can imagine plugging into a kinetic display or one of the, the big transparent screens or other things, uh, that might have like specialized needs. It's not as simple as just taking a piece of just taking a regular image and putting it on there and having it work. Um, other uh, interesting points, I think that uh, the, immerse, the term immersive gets thrown around a lot. For me, that doesn't always mean huge in 360, but those tend to get a lot of uh, popularity because they just want something that's, that's big and, and sort of envelops you, but you can get something immersive from something that's smaller. Um, there's also this challenge of sustainability with these things. There's a lot of different technologies. They do, some of them eat up a lot of energy and materials. And that's a question of which ones are sort of the most valuable and, and long lasting in those spaces. Um, I think just to wrap up some of my learnings, I think that things like holograms and novelty and, and flash don't always save a bad idea if you're, if you're coming from a place of just using a technology that might prop up uh, uh, another idea. It may not be a, a long lasting idea or it's, it's not gonna, people may, might not remember it a couple of years from, from then, but uh, and that, that's this like gimmicks or not, not a super memorable thing. Um, I think if we had holograms tomorrow, you would probably have uh, people who would be coming to you a month later being like, well, we want something. What's, what's the next step from holograms? So it's not necessarily the hologram that people are after. It's just 
novelty and and uh, and being able to bring those those new effects to things. Um, I think that projects that are long lasting are people that are able to use displays with purpose and not just using them for that flash element. I think one of the things that drew me to Deep Local is we have a, a strong focus on physical interactions and physical uh, sort of expressions of technology. And when we use displays, it's it's always with a strong purpose uh, of like, they need to be integrated into a physical object in a, a way that makes sense or sort of hidden in a special way. And uh, just create something a little more magical and integrated rather than like the display being the centerpiece. It's more about like the person interacting with that object. Um, and another last one is I, I think that again, that like an elegant, cheap and simple use of this stuff could be a lot better than sort of complicated, expensive stuff. Um, and along with that small being just more impactful than large sometimes. Um, and I think using all of that stuff to tell a richer story, but also giving space to just experiment and prototype test things over and over until you get somewhere. Uh, it's always the important part. I've tried a lot of things with a lot of these technologies and sometimes it's like, oh, I thought this would be interesting, but it really wasn't. And to do it better, it might just cost a lot more money. Um, and I think to close, it's just, yeah, making weird, beautiful mistakes with, uh, with technologies and, and the ideas that you're trying to communicate um, but that's it. Uh, this is the this is a QR code link. Uh, it's also on my website. But if you all want to go to see the the like full displays right up, if you want to, anything that I showed in the talk is going to be on there. Uh, should be able to find it in different categories. But I think that is it for me. And I think I went over a couple minutes. But. <laughs>